The crew members of Expedition 4243 come from three nations and three space agencies, but they have one mission, to carry on the legacy of the International Space Station. Terry Virts from Columbia, Maryland, will return to the International Space Station for the second time. The Air Force Colonel spent 13 days in space in 2010 as the pilot of Space Shuttle Endeavour, delivering the Tranquility Node and Cupola to the station. Terry will serve as an Expedition 42 flight engineer before taking command of Expedition 43. Anton Shkaplerov's second visit to the station will begin with the liftoff of Expedition 42. The retired Air Force Colonel spent five and a half months aboard ISS during Expeditions 29 and 30. During his time on orbit, Anton completed a six hour and 15 minute spacewalk. From Italy, Samantha Cristoforetti was selected as an ESA astronaut in 2009. The Air Force captain has logged over 500 flight hours in six different types of military aircraft. Samantha will be the second long-duration astronaut from the Italian Space Agency and the European Space Agency's eighth. From America, Russia, and Italy, the crew of Expedition 4243 will continue the uninterrupted presence of humans in space into its 15th year. Good afternoon, and thanks for joining us here at the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston. We're excited to have the Expedition 42 crew with us. They're readying for their launch to the space station in November. So thank you, Terry, Anton, and Samantha, for joining us. We know this is a busy time for you guys making your final preparations. Uh, Butch Wilmore and his crew are in Baikonur readying for their launch just uh, a week from today, actually. So, um, and you'll be joining them on orbit. Um, I know it's going to be a busy increment. Can you tell us a little bit about what's planned and what you're looking forward to? Uh, I can, first of all, just introduce briefly, we just saw the video, but uh, myself, Anton, and Samantha are very happy and excited to be here today. And uh, we're a little bit of a unique crew in that we're an Air Force, all Air Force crew, so we're excited about that. And that theme got reflected in our Soyuz patch, um, but it's good to be here. The press conference means that we're getting close. Whenever you have your crew press conference launch is not too far away, so we're excited to see the press releases that we get after our conference today. Um, the mission that we'll be doing six months on the station is going to be uh, very busy. We're going to be primarily focused on maintaining the station safely and keeping it running and leaving it a better place than when we left. But of course, the mission of the space station is science. And so uh, we have a very aggressive science program that we're doing. Roughly 170 US-based uh, experiments, NASA and US companies and in private uh, educational institutions and over 70 other international experiments. So there's a lot of science that we'll be doing. Um, we may end up getting a few spacewalks, uh, if not more, it looks like. And so it's going to be a busy six months. Absolutely. Um, like you said, a lot of science. Um, you touched on it uh, in your opening about the, um, the, the, the unique component of you all having Air Force mm -hmm. uh, background from your respective countries and the patch. Um, I think we have that that we can show the viewers, but can you mm -hmm. tell us a little bit about that? I know a lot of people might not know that the crew actually really leads the design of the patch. There's a lot of your personalities uh, as a crew reflected in that. Can you kind of share with us a little bit about what the sure. thought process was there? My Air Force background was um, F-16s at the U.S. Air Force, and Anton was a MiG-29 pilot in the Russian Air Force, and Samantha started her career in Texas uh, at Shepard Air Force Base and then flew AMXs in the Italian Air Force. So um, maybe Anton can talk about the patch and uh, a little bit about what it symbolizes. And Samantha, I know, was involved also in the patch. Ну да, мы этот бейдж делали совместно. Вначале были наброски, эскизы, потом мы много обменивались по почте с Самантой. Естественно, мы советовались с Терри, как будет лучше выглядеть нас бейдж. В принципе, сам бейдж символизирует э, самый основной прибор для пилотов. Это авиагоризонт, который показывает наше положение в пространстве. И положение нашего космического корабля показывает как раз э, наклонение орбиты, которое у нас будет во время старта. Дальше... Э, Как сказал Терри, так как мы все трое пилоты, то тень от нашего космического корабля, которая будет под, ну, находится под нашим космическим кораблем, она такая вот тень, сделанная из трех самолетов. То есть носовая часть это Т-16, Терри самолет, средняя от моего, и 
хвостовая часть Саманты. То есть символизирует объединение наших сил. So it is a joint effort. Uh, first, we worked on a sketch together. I uh, wrote a lot and talked with Samantha and also with Terry. And the patch does symbolize all of our efforts. And the main thing on the patch that you see is the horizon, which is the main tool that we use when we are flying. Also, the orientation of orbit has to do with the orientation that we will be taking during launch. The shade is in the, sa in the shape of the spaceship, and also it's made up out of three planes. First, the front portion is the T-16, uh, which is Terry's. The second is mine, and the third portion is Samantha's. And this symbolizes <coughs> our joint efforts in this mission. Yeah, if I can add, I mean, it's basically the artificial horizon, which, as Anton said, is the main uh, instrument that you have as, as a pilot in your, in your cockpit. And that was really the, the basic idea that Anton himself came up with. Um, and it's, it shows actually a pitch of the aircraft if you were reading it as an artificial horizon of 51, which is the inclination of the orbit. And then it shows a bank angle, so a roll of 15, which is the TMA-15M. And, and then there is this nice touch, which as actually suggested by a good friend of mine back in Italy, Riccardo Rossi, who also did a lot of the graphic work, which is by adding this, this shadow, which is, as we said, made um, from different parts of our respective aircraft. And it really wants to symbolize the continuity between uh, aviation and space flight. Wow. Sounds like you did a beautiful job of incorporating all the aviation and navigation types of symbolism, so nice job. Um, we're going to go ahead and start uh, taking questions here. We actually have a lot of media joining us, as well as some Cooperative Pathways students here from the Johnson Space Center. So with that, we'll start taking questions. Uh, we'll start with reporters. If you can raise your hand, state your name and affiliation, and we'll start with you. Yes. Yeah. Wait, I want the mic? No. Okay. Uh, James Oberg with NBC News. I want to ask Anton about the improvements, the upgrade to the Russian segment that you will be seeing during this next six months. Uh, will there be upgrades in communications and other facilities on the Russian segment that you will work on? Спасибо за хороший вопрос. Прошло всего три года со старта моего предыдущего старта и всего два с половиной года, как я не был в космосе. И могу сказать, что станция очень сильно не поменялась. В принципе, уже в то время, когда у меня был первый мой полет, то станция, в принципе, была закончена в своем строительстве. Thank you for such a great question. It has been three years since my first launch, and only two and a half years since I've been in space. And I can say that the station has not undergone a lot of change since then. When I arrived during my first flight, the station was pretty much complete. И как мы знаем, что строительство станции начиналось в основном с российских сегментов, они, конечно, уже им более 10 лет, поэтому не смогу сказать, что сейчас меняются панели, потому что за 10 лет, как в любом доме, в любой квартире, декорация становится уже старенькой, и поэтому мы ее заменяем, чтобы было чисто, красиво и уютно, как дома. Also, I can say that the station, when it was beginning to be built, was initially constructed from mostly Russian segments, and it's been over 10 years since that has begun, so now we are changing out a lot of the panels, because in the same way as in a house or in an apartment, the decor gets old, you need to change things out. And that's what we are doing on station. We are changing things so that everything looks clean, cozy, and like a nice home. Okay. Go ahead. Association. Question for Terry. You mentioned some spaceworks coming up. Uh, what are the tasks planned for these spacewalks? Uh, the main task for the first spacewalks that are scheduled uh, will be to get the station ready to receive capsules. We just had an announcement uh, the other day about the next American spacecraft that will be built by Boeing and SpaceX. And so our task on the Expedition 42 crew and also probably on the 43 crew will be to lay the wiring down and the cables on the outside of the station that will, um, when the, will allow the docking ring to work for the capsules to attach to. So getting the docking system going is a big part of our spacewalks. Also the robotic arm that's very important when we send up cargo ships um, for two different ones from Orbital and SpaceX, the arm grabs them and then attaches them to the station. And so this arm has been there for over 10 years 
and uh, it's getting a little sticky, so we're going to have to go out and put some grease on it. And so that's one of the tasks on the space uh, this for the spacewalks. So that's the main, um, at least initial task that we'll be doing. Okay. Um, we'll go ahead and take a couple student questions. If you can state your name and organization where you're working here at JSC. Okay, go ahead. Um, my name is Eric Ballesteros. I work in the ISS Ethos Department in the Mission Operations Directorate, and this question is open to all. Um, relating to science, uh, what kind of experiments are you expecting to be working on <clears throat> from those experiments? Uh, which ones are you most excited to uh, work with? I'll start maybe, and then you guys can answer. Um, there's a lots and lots of science that we're doing. Like I said, there are roughly 170 American experiments and over 70 international ones. But uh, there's a couple that are really exciting. One of the ones that's most exciting for me, I, I really like astronomy. And there's a big instrument on the outside of the station called AMS, Alpha Magnetic Spectrometer. There's also an instrument on the Japanese segment called MAXI. And um, these instruments are looking for antimatter and really super high energy particles that come in to Earth from all around the galaxy and re really beyond the galaxy. And um, Maxi is looking for x-rays. And so when you add up the, the different information that we can collect from the station, um, I think we're right now we're in the process of making some pretty amazing discoveries about what the universe is made out of and um, what exactly is out there. And a certain part of what we're learning is that we really didn't know what we didn't know. You know, the more you find out about the universe, you realize that there's things that you didn't know. But that's astronomy. We're doing a lot of human re physiology research, um, specifically on bone loss. There's some pretty exciting things that have potential applications to on Earth um, problems that people have, like osteoporosis and muscle degradation. And I'm doing some specific uh, work in that area. Um, we're looking at immunology, um, lots of other experiments. I don't want to name them all and, and leave my crewmates without anything to name. Um, do you guys have anything in particular that is interesting? <clears throat> I mean, as, as Terry mentioned, we're talking about over 200 experiments. And uh, truth to be told, there's a lot of those experiments, like the ones that Terry mentioned, that uh, run outside. and. Uh, Either they're autonomous or, or the ground actually controls them. Uh, so um, it's good to be up there and keep the station running so those experiments can, can run and we can get all that science from them. But we're not necessarily directly involved. So I'm especially excited about those experiments where I can get hands on. I'm, I'm somebody who likes to you know, work with my hands and maybe set up you know, complex equipment. It's something that I enjoy doing. And, uh, it, it kind of makes me feel a little bit like a scientist. I'm more like, like, like a lab technician, I guess, because I don't really necessarily grasp, grasp all the science that's behind it. And certainly, it wasn't me who developed it. But just being able to be hands-on on something a little bit complex, that makes it interesting for me. So um, you know, I, I certainly look forward to working on the, um, science, you know, the microgravity science glove box. There's an experiment that I was trained where, where you, you actually have to um, work with uh, some virulent cultures. We're trying to put together two aspects that actually were two discoveries of spaceflight, which is one, uh, uh, virulent or viruses become more aggressive and virulent when they are on orbit. And on the other side, your immune systems, or your immune cells become weaker or less effective. So there is this experiment where you're actually putting those things together and seeing what happens. And you really get hands-on in all this uh, lab work inside the glove box. So that's going to be really interesting. Um, I think Terry and, Upper, Terry and I are signed up for a European Space Agency experiment uh, that uh, most likely we will be doing, although it's not 100% sure. That's called airway monitoring, and that's an extremely complex setup where we're going to be breathing out of a special equipment, a special gas mixture. And the idea there is to study the gases exchange in your lungs. So a very new field, very interesting. Um, for you know, fundamental science to understand better how that works, how your lungs work, but also for future exploration, how um, does reduced pressure and the fact that particles are actually floating around in the space station, how does that affect the health of your lungs? Um, and that's going to be very interesting because it's going to be the first experiment that actually takes place in the airlock at a reduced pressure. So um, certainly a very interesting setup. OK, we can. Uh, we have some time for some other questions. Go ahead. Eric Lopez, and I'm working with the Flight Aerosciences and CFP. And I was wondering, uh, what was the most difficult part of your training process? Learning Russian. 
<laughs> it's easy. <laughs> Through no but that's an easy question. No, there, the, the thing about being an astronaut is that there's lots and lots of different things completely unrelated to one another that you have to learn and, and practice. And so um, learning foreign languages is um, something that uh, everybody has to go through. And um, Samantha is probably, the other thing you learn about being an astronaut is there's whatever you think you're good at, there's someone much better than you at. And Samantha is the perfect example for that. She's amazing at languages. Just about any language you can think of, she speaks very well. But um, the, uh, <laughs> not, not by much. Um, flying, we get to fly jets. And of course, as, as pilots, that's a, a really great part of our, and probably the most important and most beneficial part of our training is the ability to fly. Um, learning about science. Again, we're, we're pilots, we're not scientists, but I really enjoy that, learning the science aspect of things. Um, you really, being a mechanic is probably the most important thing that we do because keeping this million pound vehicle operating with only a few people, um, you know, we have to be the mechanics and run the sewer system and be the cooks and be the doctors. You know, we have to be everything that your city has. We have to do that. So you kind of have to learn everything. Being a doctor was a really a fun part of my training, um, getting to go work at the emergency room and see how doctors take care of, you know, can take care of serious situations. So it's a diverse um, job. Any, what's the hardest thing for you guys? Sami Trudna. Ну, я думаю, для меня самое сложное, как и для Терри, это было не уснуть в тренажере космического корабля «Союз», когда мы все вместе тренировались. I think the most difficult thing for me, as for Terry, was to not fall asleep in the Soyuz trainer during our simulation. Потому что Саманта так хорошо подготовлена, что мне как командиру и Терри как борт инженеру два можно ничего не делать, мы можем вот так скрестить руки и спать. Because Samantha had prepared so well that we had nothing to do, me as commander and Terry. Она все сделает и без ошибок, как как положено. As a flight engineer, she will do everything. She will take care of everything. So we just had to take it easy and relax. Но если серьезно, конечно, я считаю, самое сложное же, второй раз к полету на ту же станцию, на том же практически корабле, самое сложное было найти подход первое время ко всему экипажу. Мы не были практически знакомы до встречи в этом экипаже, поэтому вот надо было вместе все научиться делать, жить, работать в течение полугода на станции. Я думаю, у нас это получилось. Uh, but seriously, I think as uh, someone who's flying for the second time, the hardest thing was getting to be close with my fellow crew members. We hadn't really not met each other before beginning the training and then meeting for the first time and learning how to work together and how to live together as one unit that we will be on the station for six months. That was the challenge and I think we did it very well. Samantha, anything else to add about training from your perspective? Uh, well, I, I had a chan the chance that I already spoke Russian before this all started, so uh, that wasn't too hard. Um, for me, I guess the greatest challenge was probably the spacewalking training. I am uh, unfortunately not necessarily built for the suit because of my size. We, we don't have suits uh, like in a, in a small size enough that would fit me properly. And so that does present a little bit of an additional challenge because you have to be able to uh, do the same things that people do that have a nice fit in the suit, but you have the additional challenge of making it work um, with this somewhat too bulky uh, space suit. And uh, that, you know, that's a learning curve because, you, you know, you, you kind of has to, you know, it's a lot of mental work to try and find the ways that actually are going to work for you. Um, and, uh, but on the other hand, as it always happens in life, that which is the hardest thing is also the one that once you are, you know, eventually master it is, is the one that is more gratifying. So, you know, looking back, it's been the most gratifying part of the training as well. Um, I wanted to follow up on what you were talking about with the medical training, because mm -hmm. I, I don't know if a lot of people know there's at least one crew medical officer on each crew identified. Um, and to some degree, you all get some baseline training on blood draws and things like that well, that will be required for uh, sample collections. Right. And then you talked about the hospital, going mm -hmm. to a hospital, and I think you also go to a dental office and get some dental training. Right. I mean, that's all fascinating stuff that people probably don't think falls under astronaut training, but can you elaborate a little bit about what that's like? Sure. Um, on shuttle flights, we had designated crew medical officers that got training, um, but on the station flight, we all get 
you know, ba that training. And it's probably equivalent to an EMT. Um, we can deal with heart attacks, uh, the, those kind of things. Certainly blood draws and basic um, procedures that you do are required because we do that for our experiments. But uh, even beyond that, on the space station, there's basic level of care. There is a small pharmacy. You know, we have a, a container of different medicines that you can treat things. Um, but any kind of advanced surgery, obviously, we can't do in space. So luckily, we have the Soyuz that we can come back to Earth if a crew member had a serious problem and bring them back. Um, and we have an AED in space that we can use in case someone has a heart attack. Knock on wood, thankfully, they, they screen us. They, they do a pretty good job of making sure that we're in good shape and it's not likely that anything bad will happen. But as part of uh, my training, I had a chance to go work in an operating room and an uh, emergency room for a few nights and um, even in a dental clinic. And so I got to see lots of different things that I never would have seen as a, just a pilot. So I really enjoyed it. It was a fun part of the training. Uh, it's a part of the training that hopefully we will never need to use, but it was good doing it. Absolutely. And you have to learn how to do blood draws on yourself. You can, we do blood draws on ourselves or on each other and yeah, it, it's, um, that's something that you just do and you have to get over that part of it. But um, everything, just about everything is harder in space because stuff floats around and like these water bottles would be on the corner of the room right now. So doing a blood draw, you have to get tape out and you have to get all your vials on the on the duct tape and get the syringe ready. And so just getting everything ready and then once you use it, it's going to float away. And so you have to keep stuff organized or it floats away. Okay. Great stuff. Okay, uh, any other questions from our student group? Okay, we've got a couple down here. Go ahead. We'll start at the far end. Um, you described some of the experiments. Oh, my name is Dorothy and I'm from ER4. You've discussed some of the science experiments that you all are looking forward to. What was your favorite part of your training on the ground? Favorite part of training? There's a big pause here. Yeah, the, there's a lot of good things. Well, Samantha just said spacewalk training was that yeah, yeah, definitely. As I said, it was the most challenging and difficult, but that, as I said, also made it definitely the, the best. And, it's you know, I, I'm somebody who looks forward to a challenge, so that made it really fun and interesting. Uh, but also, I guess, um, learning how to be a flight engineer on the Soyuz was, was extremely gratifying. Um, you know, it kind of brought me back a little bit to. Um, Flying a new airplane, where you have to, you know, learn, get familiar with all the systems and the procedures, and uh, you know what, what you do in a nominal case, what you do if something goes wrong. Um, and I, I, I've always been trained as a single-seat aircraft pilot, so it was also interesting to actually learn how to be a three-seater, where you actually have a crew that you have to work with and you have to coordinate. So a very different mindset. Um, so that was very interesting and fun. Yeah, learning the Soyuz was a, a lot of the training I'd done for my last space flight. So, but the Soyuz was something new. So that was, that was fun. Doing it in Russian language, uh, it actually became fun. It was a challenge at first, but I really enjoyed it. And uh, it's a new spaceship, so that was that was good to learn that. Yeah. So we have to stop Terry from speaking Russian in the U.S. training. Time. <laughs> stop. <laughs> Do you have a favorite part? Ну, не знаю, поддержу вас, все-таки для меня тоже тренировка на Российском Рубеже Союз наиболее интересная, хоть это уже вторая моя подготовка, и в принципе корабль не, не, не очень сильно поменялся с моего прошлого полета, но вот новый экипаж, новые инструктора, причем они умудряются придумать более сложные, более запутанные, нештатные ситуации, из которых нам приходится вместе выходить. I will add on to you. I also agree that the Soyuz training was one of the most interesting parts, though for me it is the second time and there are not very many big changes, but it's a new crew, it's a new instructor, and with every new instructor group, they manage to come up with more and more complex off nominal situations that are more and more difficult to resolve. Okay, we'll take another question, go ahead. Woods. I work in the flight mechanics and trajectory design branch here at JSC. And my question has to do with um, a couple of weeks ago, I think, uh, NASA released a time-lapse video of the ISS releasing, I think it was a Cygnus cargo ship. Mm -hmm. And it was sped up, but the way it just zoomed off, like mm -hmm. in my mind, I'm like, yep, that's, that's Star Wars. <laughs> um, so I was just wondering, with, with ISS and uh, uh, and all the work that's going into spaceflight technologies, what, what are you guys really excited about for the future of spaceflight? You know, I hope 
um, people say, what does a space station mean in general? What's the long-term vision, or how is it going to be remembered? And I hope 500 years from now, people look back and see the space station as the first step towards going into the solar system and people going onto the moon and Mars and beyond that. So I'm excited about that exploration. And hopefully, in your flight mechanics, you can design some trajectories that go somewhere besides low Earth orbit. Uh, and hopefully, that, I think that's going to be happening soon. So that, to me, that's what's exciting, is using the station to go beyond that. Um, there's lots of technologies that we're testing today on the station that will help us with that. Um, ways to keep our bodies healthy for, I mean, we've shown that people can live in space for six months and come back to Earth and in great shape. Uh, Steve Swanson just got back, and uh, he's in amazing shape. He's, he's just in great shape. So, and we've been demonstrating that now for 10 years or more on the, on the space station. And before that, the Russian Mir station. And so it is a great way to demonstrate that we can go beyond Earth orbit. And so for me, that's, that's what's exciting. We're going to switch now um, to social media. We have been taking questions, and we'll continue taking questions using the hashtag AskNASA. So we'll turn it over to Megan for uh, a few questions being uh, submitted that way. All right. Our first two questions come from the International Space Station Facebook page. From Angelique Knowles, she wants to know, I am currently going to school for physics and astrobiology. I intend to apply for astronaut candidacy afterwards. Besides the written requirements, what else stands out on an application to be an astronaut? My dream is to work on the ISS. I share that dream. Um, the one piece of advice that I give to people who want to be astronauts is that um, it's important to do what you want. A lot of people will ask, hey, should I do this, or should I do that, or should I be a pilot, or should I? Um, so we've all been given gifts. And if you pursue your gift and do it really well, then you'll do it really well and it's something that you love. And so um, if she's a physics major and an astrobiology major, that's going to get her on the right track. Um, so there's not really one thing that you can pick, um, but I think when, when we select astronauts, we look for people who are passionate about what they do and who do it really well. So it's important to do what you're called to do and, and, um, and not necessarily something else because you think that's, that's the path that you should go. Um, Mark Smith wants to know, my own fear about going into space is the massive acceleration and mania of launch. I know you are trained to deal with that acceleration, but are you still apprehensive for any of you? Can you talk about Soyuz acceleration? Ускорение на Soyuz? Ну, могу сказать, что ускорения, которые мы испытываем на взлете и посадке, довольно не очень большие. Летав на самолетах и истребителях, как и Саманта мы испытывали намного больше перегрузок. Well, I can say that the acceleration on the Soyuz is not very significant. As someone who has flown on a fire, fighter pilot like Terry and Samantha, those loads are much greater. Да, конечно, есть вибрации, есть сложности, которые испытывает наш организм после попадания в космос. Это невесомость, которая, к сожалению, не очень хорошо влияет на наш организм. Плюс радиация, но, конечно, мы все понимаем, что профессия астронавта это очень опасная профессия, но это очень интересная профессия. И ради того, чтобы увидеть Землю через иллюминатор, можно отдать все. Yes, there are vibrations and there are other difficulties that our organism has to go through once we arrive in space. For example, weightlessness, and that takes a toll on our body, and also radiation. And everyone knows that being an astronaut is a dangerous profession, but it is definitely very interesting. It is so worth it. Everything becomes worth it once you're able to see the Earth from the window of the space station. OK. Um, we're going to switch now over to the phone bridge, where we have Elizabeth Howell joining us from space.com. Hi there. Thanks for taking my question. I was curious, and I guess this might be for uh, Terry. Can you talk a little bit more about the nature of um, how nominal spacewalks are going in terms of the planning? Because, of course, there was that incident last year. But I saw some tweets on Doug Wheelock's Twitter this morning about an October 7th spacewalk. So just how is the investigation going? Are we, are we back to normal spacewalks now? Uh, everybody always asks me how many spacewalks I'll do. And I tell them somewhere between 0 and 10. Um, and that one of the, na the nature of spacewalking is uh, you have to be flexible. Um, on the shuttle, the spacewalks are very planned out. And we knew exactly what was going to happen. But as a space station astronaut, you have to be ready for anything. So uh, there was a problem. It wasn't a huge problem, but there was a potential safety issue with the batteries that we use in the spacesuit. And so 
Uh, we decided to delay by a few months the spacewalks, and we're launching new batteries next week on the Soyuz. Uh, and also, we'll send up some spare batteries on one of the cargo resupply vehicles. So once the, the new um, batteries get there, we should be able to do spacewalks again in October. Um, and these were ones that were originally planned in August. So assuming that all those things happen and these um, Expedition 41 spacewalks happen in October, then on Expedition 42, as I said earlier, we should be doing two spacewalks that are designed to lay the foundation, lay the cables, and set the stage for the docking ring for uh, American capsules to go there uh, a few years from now. That's the first part of our spacewalking question. There's other um, more complicated interrelated dependencies down the road of which SpaceX and orbital vehicles fly when and uh, what future spacewalks will do. So during Expedition 43, there's a couple of different options. And uh, it, they, that should be decided a couple of weeks from now once these initial pieces fall into place. But as the crew, um, we can't be too involved and too worried about every uh, nuance that changes with the spacewalk plan because we would go nuts. Where, you know, where We have a great team of, of managers and engineers that plan that for us. And our job is just to be ready to do what we need to do, and that's, and that's what we'll be able to do. Samantha and I are both um, trained to do the American spacewalks, and Anton, of course, is trained to do uh, the Russian spacewalks. So um, if you ask me in six months from now, I'll have a better idea about the spacewalks for Expedition 42 and 43. I can tell you all about them then. OK, and as a quick follow-up, um, the investigation that was going on into the, uh, the incident last summer uh, was, had a number of recommendations that needed to be addressed before it was going to be, before Spacebox was going to resume. So as far as you know, is that, has that happened? Have they got most of those reps finished? Yes, I, it's mostly been uh, tied up. The um, investigation report has been released. Uh, I believe you should be able to find that online. But um, as far, from the crew's point of view, uh, there's a couple of things that we do to mitigate the possibility of getting water in the helmets. Um, we've done some maintenance on the spacesuits themselves, and uh, we think that we found the root cause and some pro some contamination that got in the suit that clogged some pinpoint holes that caused water to, to come out into the helmet. So hopefully that problem's fixed. And uh, even if we do have water in the helmet, we have improved procedures to get back inside uh, quickly. And uh, we have some material in the spacesuit that should actually absorb the water. And uh, they've added a small little snorkel that you can actually breathe, even if your face is surrounded in water, that you'll be able to breathe. So um, there's been a lot of uh, work done on that front on different aspects of that problem that um, we're in much better shape now than we were a year ago, obviously, when the, before we knew that, that we had this problem. So we, we all feel very confident that the spacewalk um, problem that Luca Parmitano had uh, last year has been uh, resolved. And I feel very confident with that. All right, thank you, Elizabeth. We'll return back here now to the Johnson Space Center and uh, questions here. So if you can just uh, raise your hand if you have a question and state your name again. Go ahead. Hi, my name is Jeff Waters. Uh, I work with ILC Dover, and I'm helping design the next generation of our spacesuits. Now, if there was one thing you could improve upon the current suit, what would it be? Besides would you like to take that, Samantha? <laughs> I'll take a small size. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Thank you. <laughs> No, generally speaking, I guess, I mean, obviously there is a size issue, but in, in general, even for people who have a, the proper size, I think uh, mobility is a big thing. Of course, a, a suit that was more mobile that allowed you to move a little bit more like your normal body does as opposed to having to accommodate all the uh, limitations of the suit joints, I think would be probably the number one yeah. thing. The Apollo spacesuits uh, were basically flexible all over. You could move around in them very well. And um, when we built spacesuits for the space shuttle and space station, we knew that we'd be doing a lot of spacewalks. And they were worried that a flexible spacesuit was more likely to rip and have a leak. So they built these metal bearings that are they're not going to rip. They're solid metal bearings. Um, but our bodies are not made in, to be robots in one direction. And so um, a lot of astronauts end up having shoulder problems just from having, you, you know, the suit is not designed the way the human body is designed. So like Samantha said, if future spacesuits could be more flexible and in different, um, like the way the human body was designed, um, that will that will be a big improvement. Yeah, I think that's something we're actually really working on. The next suit really has like outstanding mobility. Right. I know there's a big, been a big push for the small EMU. So. Oh really? Yeah. Oh, I'm glad to hear that. <laughs> awesome. 
No, I'm 165. That's my guess. Okay, Good other guess. questions? Good discussion. I see a hand back there. Sorry, go ahead. Hi, I'm Melissa St. Crew. I work in CX12, the Mutual Buoyancy Lab. And um, Christopher Reddy, you were talking to us the other day about the low patches, the uh, Expedition 42 patches. Do you mind explaining what the don't panic slogan, <laughs> for lack of a better phrase? Oh, yeah, I have them here. Oh, you're talking about those yeah. little stickers? Oh. <laughs> well, um, I was I, I was super excited when I was assigned to an ISS expedition. Well, mostly because I was assigned to an ISS expedition, of course. But <laughs> part of the excitement was also that it was uh, with Terry, so that was that very was exciting. the main. I was going to say yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that, of course, with Anton, that was even greater. But um, but then part of the excitement was that it was 42, and uh, I'm a, I'm a big science fiction fan, and one of the things that I really love is this. Um, trilogy in five parts that um, some of you might know, which is the Douglas Adams books. And uh, the first one of the book is The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. And in this book, it's kind of funny, but 42 is the answer to the ultimate question of life, the universe, and everything. Now, of course, nobody knows what the question is, but 42 is the answer. <laughs> and The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy is the title of the book, but it's also a book in the novel that everybody carries with them. And it has this big words written on the cover, which is, don't panic. And so we have this little patch made, which is, you know, it has a little hitchhiking hand, which is from the, um, I guess, from the movie that was made, and, uh, and then 42, don't panic. On the other hand, I can announce that next week, our poster is going to be released, our expedition poster. And I'm not going to spoil it for you, but I'm going to just say it's going to be epic. <laughs> You heard it here first. Okay. <laughs> cool. One of the, We're uh, standing by. <laughs> another. Uh, oh, yeah, definitely. Towel, yeah. Always carry your towel with you. <laughs> <laughs> one of the other cool things about 42, one of the fun things as a crew, we've had a chance to go see the Astros, the Rockets, and the Texans. So I, I, I took Anton and Samantha to see all the local American sports and um, is all baseball fans, and now Samantha knows 42 was the number of Jackie Robinson. So it was a cool mission to be on for the Douglas Adams book and also the baseball connection. That didn't make sense. Um, we'll turn back to questions. Go ahead, we have one back there. Um, my name is Matthew Ruan. I work in the Innovation Design Center, also sometimes called the Sandbox. Um, this is also related to a book called The Andromeda Strain. Um, I was wondering, is there a procedure or protocol to, uh, uh, that's meant to deal with um, the encounter of an extraterrestrial life form, perhaps? <laughs> Are you, you guys trying to deal with something like that? We, actually, we just had our meeting with our procedures people. And I, how many procedures do we have on board? How many pages of procedures? It was like hundreds of thousands of pages yeah. of procedures. Mm -hmm. And there's not one of those on board to deal with that. So. <laughs> My assumption yeah. is that it would be some kind of form of bacteria, so the procedure would be containment. But yeah. <laughs> we'd probably not be talking to them right away. Yeah. <laughs> All right, we're going to yeah. switch back to social media. Um, I believe we have some more questions. So, and again, to our audience, to be sure to submit them using hashtag AskNASA. Go ahead, Megan. All right, these questions come from Twitter. Um, the first is from Power Moves for Astro Terry. In space, does your vision change? Does food taste the same? Um, the first question about vision, that's a great question. It's one of the most important problems that we're dealing with right now. Uh, in the short duration universe that we had at NASA before, about 30% of astronauts came back with some vision problems and then they, it, it corrected itself. And now we're finding that 60% of long duration flyers have vision and some of those don't correct. I mean, they, they, they can still see, but you have deg degraded vision. Um, and so one of the main experiments I'm doing is going to be a pretty comprehensive study of vision, I'll be doing an ultrasound on my eyes, uh, an OCT scan, um, a fundoscope, several different cameras looking inside the eye, some ultrasound of my brain and heart and how the blood pressure and blood flow works into the eye. And so there's a very um, kind of intense focus on that problem right now of astronaut vision. Uh, it hasn't, so far, knock on wood, it hasn't been anything terrible, but it is something that we're noticing and it's not something that we want for the future. So we're studying it right now to hopefully come up with ways to prevent it. Uh, bone loss and muscle loss ha has been a problem in the past. 
And so we studied that, and one of the ways to prevent it is through exercise and certain different types of nutrition. We're studying that also. But that's an example of how we kind of studied something and figured out how to fix it. Um, I just heard from our strength and conditioning guy this morning that guys come back with only 0.3% of bone loss. So basically, you're, because of the exercise we do and because of the, um, some of the different medicines they give us, we're basically coming back with almost no bone loss. And so hopefully, that success will translate into the eye problem and we can keep guys' eyes healthy. Uh, one more social media question? Yeah, um, and then also about the food. Oh, food, yes. Uh, you know, I enjoyed the food. The food that we get from our food lab here is much better than what I would cook if I were a bachelor on my own. Um, <laughs> what do you, Anton can probably answer the food best since he lived there. Ну, могу поделиться своим опытом, проведя уже почти полгода на станции. Значит, мы всегда имеем специальный тест food перед полетом тех продуктов, которые мы будем есть. Это продукты, которые поставляет российская сторона, американская, европейская, а также японская, канадская, космические агентства. Well, I can share my experience because I have been on station almost half a year. Uh, before we fly, we do a food test where we try out all the different foods that we'll be eating on station. The foods are provided by the Russian Space Agency, NASA, uh, the European Space Agency, the Canadian Space Agency, and the Japanese Space Agency. Конечно, как Терри сказал, все, что мы пробуем очень вкусно, мы бы так, по крайней мере, с ним не приготовили. Вот, например, даже Саманта имеет какого-то специального итальянского повара, который для нее подготовил специальные продукты, специальные, да, самую лучшую еду. And uh, I agree with Terry that at least he and I would not be able to prepare anything like that on the Earth. The food there is much better. Uh, and Samantha, she has a special Italian chef that has prepared special foods for her. И представляете, вот в течение полугода есть одни и те же продукты, которые в основном из консервных банок либо сублимированные продукты. Вот какие бы они не были вкусными на земле, через три-четыре месяца ты понимаешь, открывая новый свой контейнер еды, что все, что ты там видишь, ты это уже есть не хочешь. But even regardless of how good these foods may taste on Earth when you're trying them, after half a year of eating canned foods and sublimated foods, whenever you open something after three or four months, it's just not very exciting to see it and to think about eating something from that container again. И, конечно, самая главная была мечта после возвращения на Землю — это поесть нормальный дух, который только приготовила твоя супруга на кухне, пусть это будет суп или борщ, либо кусок мяса, стейк, который приготовил, например, Терри. And of course, the dream was once you returned back to Earth to have some real food that was prepared by your spouse, maybe some soup or borscht or a steak prepared by Terry. <laughs> all right. Um, now that you've whetted all of our appetites, <laughs> we'll take one more media question. Uh, Jim? I'd like to ask a question that combines on both comments about looking through the window at the Earth and the other comments about what you do if you met an alien. Uh, in the past year, Unexpectedly, two crewmen have seen rockets launch from Earth by accident. They were doing something, and something else showed up in the window. So, don't stick to your schedules. Uh, are you off when you look out that window? Are you looking for unusual things? And, and will you tell you, will you tell us about it if you see them? The uh, I only was able to spend short duration during the space shuttle program in space, but looking at Earth is the most powerful drug you can imagine. You just can't get enough of it, and that's kind of all you want to do. Not only Earth, but also looking up into space. And so um, I'm sure I'll be spending my time looking at, at everything. And there's so many amazing things to see. The uh, thunderstorms in the Amazon and Central Africa are, I mean, you just can't get enough of that, especially at dawn, because then you can see both the clouds and the lightning. You know, if it's night, all you see is lightning, or if it's day, all you see is clouds, but um, there's just a lot of things. Jim, I think there's stuff that I don't even know, you know, I haven't imagined what I'm going to see yet. I, I think uh, Luca saw a Russian launch. launch yeah. So did right. So um, it's, and that's really cool to look back, because you're not an earthling anymore, you're yeah, living in space. Never seen before, and views we've never right. seen before, uh, and, and I've got it with me, but. <laughs> right. The, the aurora, I remember looking out, you could see details in the atmosphere at night, but when I flew, the cameras we had weren't good enough to pick that up. But now, the, with the cameras that we have, um, they're sensitive enough. And so the, these pictures have been very popular the last year, couple of years. Um, 
but it's, I'm excited that there's a camera good enough to pick, probably even better than what our eyes are, to see it. Yeah. Any, anything, did anything surprise you maybe that you saw in space or? No. Могу добавить то, что сказал действительно Терри, когда спрашивают космонавтов или астронавтов, которые были в космосе, что самое интересное, чем они любят заниматься в свободное время, и все отвечают, это, конечно, смотреть на нашу прекрасную планету с высоты полета космической станции. I can add to what Terry is saying that when anyone asks the cosmonauts or the astronauts what do they prefer to do on space and on, on the space station, what is the most interesting thing, everyone answers that the best thing they do is to look at Earth from the space station. No, I can calm down Terry. Of course, every year we change the cameras. The best ones appear on the station. But what the human eye sees now, in my opinion, is impossible to convey to any one of the most perfect cameras that were created on the Earth. But I can uh, add to what Terry said that even though they do upgrade the cameras every year and they are getting better and better, as of now, the human eye can still behold things that the cameras will never be able to see. Ну, могу сказать, к примеру, когда работаешь, живешь на станции, бывает, пролетаешь мимо иллюминатора и видишь какое-то интересное явление на Земле. Пусть это будут харикейны, пусть это будут облака, либо пустыня под определенным углом захода Солнца. И тебе кажется, что это ну, самый прекрасный вид, который ты видишь. Ты хватаешь камеру, делаешь снимки, но когда вечером ты начинаешь просматривать эти снимки за день, который сделан на компьютере, ты видишь, что это, в принципе, обычные снимки. Это еще раз говорит о том, что то, что мы можем видеть реально, это намного лучше. Поэтому летать в космос надо. Только ради этого хотя бы. If we see something interesting, we'll send a tweet out. For sure. And I can just say that uh, when you're looking out the windows on the space station, you may see something that you think looks amazing. For example, a hurricane or the clouds or the desert under a certain angle of the setting sun. And so you dash with the camera, you take pictures, but then in the evening when you're going through all your pictures, they just look like ordinary pictures. So it is important to look out with your eyes and to experience that uh, for yourself. And if for no other reason, you should fly just for that. Okay, we are going to switch now to the European Space Agency where they're hosting some media as well. So we'll be taking those questions. Hello, this is uh, Jules from ESAPO here in uh, ESA Estrin. Do you hear me? Yes, we hear you fine. Okay, then we have gathered a few questions from our social media channel. And the first one comes from Twitter, from Spaceman. And it's for Samantha. He's wondering just how are you feeling? How do you feel a few weeks before the launch? Like you said, it's a press conference, so it means like you're getting close. How do you feel? Well, a mix of uh, feelings, I'd say. One is uh, I feel a little bit overwhelmed, I have to admit, because uh, coming close to lunch, there is a lot to do. Um, I guess most of our training, I guess, is behind us, but there is a lot of last minute things that have to get done. You know, that last emergency sim, that last run in the pool, that last vacuum chamber run. Um, and then coming closer to the launch, you have more and more like baseline data collection sections. That those are basically experiments or done for experiments where you will be the subject in space. And uh, um, scientists need the comparison. So they need to run the experiment on you a couple of times before you launch. And then they will do it in space a few times, or you will do it on yourself. And then again, when you come back, so that they compare. So there is a lot of that going on right now. Um, a lot of last minute updates from the different management teams and the flight control teams, you know, what's actually going or going to happen during our, our uh, expedition, or at least to the best of our knowledge, because as Terry said, uh, plans always change. Um, so you, you know, I, I'm, I'm definitely very, very busy. My scheduler, who's here in the room, she keeps me really busy. <laughs> but she's great. Thanks, Alicia. Um, and then you know, you have this full-time job, and then you have a lot of deadlines coming up that also keep you busy. Like you know, you have to turn in the list of the, you know the little things that you uh, want to bring to the space station, your know, personal allocation. You have to make the list of your contacts. You have to get your music ready. And it sounds very mundane and very simple, but it kind of adds up to a, a second full-time job right now. So um, on the one hand, trying to, to keep up with all of all of that is it, it's quite overwhelming. Um, on the other hand, once in a while you have events like this where um, 
you know, it, it's all about this mission that is coming up, and it really starts to sink in that, hey, I mean, this is happening really soon. So in, in a couple of months, I will be not on this planet, and, and I will be up there for six months. So it, it's starting to really sink in. But I think it, it, it really ramps up like that, just because we are so busy up to the, the very last few weeks. I think when, you, when we'll be done with the exams in, in, in Russia at the end of October, and then we'll have a rest week in, in Moscow, and then we'll have our two weeks of quarantine in, in Baikonur, and things will quiet down, I think that's where the, the emotional aspect of it really, really ramps up. And talking about the preparation of the mission, Flavio on Twitter is wondering if you had to pick the most fascinating experience of the preparation of your mission, what would that be? Um, I think what's most fascinating is the experience as a whole. And uh, I guess it's that experience of turning, especially as a person like me. I mean, just five years ago, I was doing something completely different. Um, so uh, this sole experience of, in just a few years, turning from a somebody who was very passionate about space and tried to read about space and had a lot of um, uh, knowledge as an enthusiast or from the enthusiast point of view, and then turning that person over a few years into somebody who is actually ready to fly to space and to live and work in space for six months and hopefully be able to perform uh, properly a lot of uh, very diverse uh, and complex tasks. And, and hopefully I'll be able to do that, um, or at least that's the expectation. Um, this, this whole experience of you know, transforming yourself in, in a way in a different person, at least from the professional point of view, but also you know, as a person you grow so much. I think that, that's what's most fascinating. And I really look forward to the, the next part of it, which is transforming into a person. And, and that doesn't happen in one day, right? You know, people tell you there is a learning curve. It's going to take you know, a few weeks, a month, maybe longer. But you know, having that learning curve, that learning experience, and then really transforming myself into a person who can live and operate in, uh, in, in space. And I'm guessing you, you're starting packing everything, and that's why uh, probably Meryl Pitt on Twitter as well is wondering what you will put in your personal suitcase. And uh, she's also asking, what would you like to take that you couldn't take with you to space? Uh, what I would like to take is probably all my electronic gadgets. <laughs> you cannot take, unfortunately, anything that is battery powered in, in your own personal uh, stuff. So you, you have to give up all that. Um, although there's a lot of cool tools on on the space station already, um, I'm uh, you know I've, I've I've packed and I will be packing uh, very um, diverse things. I mean it, it goes from uh, comfortable clothing, warm, nice, soft, comfortable clothing that you can change into at the end of a work day, and so you're not stuck maybe with those somewhat uh, hard pants that we are um, issued um, for the six months. Uh, to uh, little gifts for family and friends, um, little things that, that I have chosen to bring up that will make nice gifts when I come back. I've, I've actually uh, printed out tiny little booklets with um, mainly poems that I have selected, and I've printed out a bunch of those, and I, I hope to bring them space and then have them as gifts for people. Um, maybe a few little gadgets that you can do cool uh, scientific demonstrations on your free time with. Um, I'm also bringing a flag for some uh, friends of mine who are, um, uh, have a handicap, but that doesn't prevent them. They're on a wheelchair, but that doesn't prevent them from actually being pilots and also actually performing in air shows as in aerobatic uh, um, flying group. And so we have this um, initiative together, which is We Fly with Futura, which is the name of my um, mission from the European Space Agency point of view, um, Dare to Fly. And, and, and so I'm bringing a flag of this uh, uh, partnership that we have that where the message is really, you know, no matter what your um, difficulties may be, and, and a handicap, of course, is a very objective difficulty, you know, you can always uh, dare to dream and find a way around those difficulties, and they're a great example of that. Well, that sounds like uh, you put a lot of your personal uh, feelings also into this mission. And Rosella, who is following you on Google+, Plus, is asking, do you have a personal or professional goal for your stay on the mission, on the station, sorry? Um, I guess my professional goal, but it goes a little bit into the personal as well, because I mean, going to space for me has been not only a professional goal, but also really the the 
the fulfillment of a dream I've had since I was a child is, is really being able to, to uh, put into good use all of the training I've had and uh, dem demonstrate also to myself that I am able to perform as a crew member on, on board to be a, a valuable member of the team. And, uh, um, you, you know, you have, you have a lot of responsibility, I think, as a crew member because there is so much that depends on you, but on, in which other people, other teams, science teams, the systems teams, so many teams have invested so much into. And you then are in the position of putting the last, the last piece of the puzzle and, and everybody hopes that you're going to do that properly. So um, professionally, really my goal is to, <laughs> to be able to do what I've been trained for properly. Um, I also have um, a little bit of an outreach theme, which is um, um, health and nutrition and a healthy relationship with food. So I hope to be able to talk um, about that um, a little bit, maybe help um, you know, a couple of people who will be following um, reach a better relationship with food in terms of understanding how um, food is you know, beyond being a, a source of energy and calories and pleasure, but it's also a messenger for your body that actually sends, every time you ingest something, it sends a message to, your, to every single cell in your body about how they should behave. And so it can really uh, make a difference in keeping you healthy and, and, and in shape and um, maximizing your well-being. Well, that sounds very uh, inspiring, and obviously uh, this seems to be uh, one of the goals as well of the mission to inspire uh, a lot of people, and, and that's why probably uh, Madame uh, Terpstra on uh, Twitter is asking, do you have someone who is inspiring you? I have a lot of people who inspire me. I um, I try to take inspiration from uh, you, you know from other people that are around me. I think that every people who you meet has something to teach you. There is something that they probably do better than you. Anybody that you meet, certainly there is at least one thing that they do better than you. And and so I think it, it's really a good idea to try and take inspiration from from every person you have a chance to meet. Okay, so those were some great questions from our European counterparts and social media again. Um, we want to thank them and thank everybody for joining us. That's going to wrap up our briefing today and a reminder for everyone that you can find out more information about their uh, Expedition 42 mission and all of their activities on our website at www.nasa.gov station. And all three of these crew members are on Twitter, so you can follow them there on the lead up to their mission and their launch on November 23rd. So thank you so much for joining us.